Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Well, how can I change? I mean, we all know that we need to change. We can't, you know, we don't want to just be happy to stay the way we are. Well, praise God, Joyce said I can have weaknesses. I just, well. No, every time we read the word, we probably see some area where we need to come up a little higher. I hope that you are convicted of something this weekend because I want to move you along. I want the word to be a prod to move us all along so we glorify God a little bit more. I want to glorify God a little more tomorrow than I did today. Amen. And so let's take a look at Galatians 3, 1 through 3. How can I change? Well, let's first look at how we cannot change. <laughs> you poor, silly, thoughtless, unreflecting, senseless Floridians. <laughs> Just so we can take this personal. <laughs> Or wherever you're at in the world today. He's talking here to the Galatian church, but we need to personalize this. Who has fascinated or bewitched or cast a spell over you? Unto whom right before your very eyes, Jesus Christ the Messiah was openly and graphically set forth and portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its works? Or was it by believing the message of the gospel? Was it from observing a law of rituals or was it from a message of faith? Now, last night we had 1,183 people stand up to say that they wanted to be born again or to renew a backslidden relationship with God. 1,183. How did that happen to them? Was it because of something they did? No, what they had been doing was sinning. <laughs> so, Here's what they did, I believe. Yep, I heard you, Jesus died for me. He forgave my sin, he loves me. I can have a relationship with him. Yes, I believe that. So they received it by faith. And then we looked at a scripture last night in Colossians 2 verse 6 that says the same way that we receive Christ Jesus, this is the same way that we now must live and walk. So we are born again by faith, we walk by faith. How do we walk? We see it all the time. I walk by faith, I walk by faith, I walk by faith. Well, do we really? I walk by faith means that I don't think that I'm going to get anything by my works and self-effort because even if I do manage to do something about my problem, I could not be doing it if God didn't give me the grace to do it. If I have one good idea, It's not because I'm smart, it's because God gave me the good idea. Every one of the, the songs that Israel and his team have written or any other great musician in the world, that came from God. That gift, that talent came from God. Amen? My ability to communicate came from God. I never took lessons on how to do this. I've never taken a lesson on how to put together a sermon. Nobody's ever taught me how to preach. I just showed up on planet Earth talking. And I happen to be a good communicator. I don't just talk, but I can get my point across. That's a gift. There's a lot of other things that I don't do. I don't cook very well. I mean, I could keep you from starving, but you know, I don't. I mean, I was okay when my kids were little, but I just, I don't want no part of it now. I mean, if Dave asked me to put cereal in a bowl, it's a chore. I said to him something yesterday, we were somewhere not at home and we'd been there a little while and he likes to eat eggs one morning and cereal the next and then eggs and then cereal and you know, he likes to change it up. So he'll eat fruit every morning when he gets up and then he eats eggs one morning and sausage and then the next day he eats cereal. So he'd been eating cereal the whole time because I wasn't cooking. <laughs> and so I, I said to him, I said, well, you know, I could, I could make you some eggs, you know, sometime. I don't. You know, and I didn't mean like that day. I said, sometime I could, 
I could make you some eggs. And he said, oh, you mean like today? And I said, oh, no, no, not today. I mean, it almost scared me. It was like, no, not today. So you know what? I'm not Susie Homemaker, but I'm a good wife. You don't have to be normal like everybody else to be good at something. Because whatever you can't do, there's something else you can do. Amen? Well, I won't get into all that. <laughs> Let me ask you one thing. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it by works or was it by faith? Verse 3, I love this. Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly? Having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? Wow, was that freeing to me when I first saw that about 25, 30 years ago. I was trying so hard to be good, and I was trying so hard to not have weaknesses and to be what I thought that God expected me to be, and I was just so frustrated all the time. I was trying to change my kids. I was trying to change myself. I was trying to change Dave. I was trying to change my circumstances. I was trying to make my ministry grow. I've said for years, I tried till I almost died. And then I found out that we're supposed to believe. <laughs> I kind of sort of knew that, but I was bypassing that. I mean, I did believe that Jesus was my savior, but then I guess I kind of felt like after that, I had to do the rest. I knew about this grace that would save me, but I didn't understand about the grace that I could live by. And what I want to share with you today is the same grace that saved you is the same grace that will get you through every day, the same grace that will change you, that will help you into new levels of holiness, that will give you favor, that will cause people to like you, that, that will open doors for you. That same favor is what we have to have, that same grace in every single area of our life. And we need to learn how to live by grace Amen. then life gets good Woo. and just in case you think that you're a special case and this couldn't possibly work for you well tonight I'm going to talk about a special grace for a special case because <laughs> you see here's the here's the bottom line no matter what kind of a mess we got God's got more grace than our mess where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. You cannot, you just cannot have a problem that God can't solve. Can you hear me today? I said, you cannot, you do not. It is impossible to have a problem that God cannot solve. Hallelujah. Psalm 121, I mean, Psalm 127, one says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Now, let's don't rush over that. They labor. <laughs> they work at it. They labor. When you labor, you're tired and worn out all the time. They labor, and their labor is in vain. You know, I would like to say that I don't think it's possible to be a truly successful person if you don't learn how to receive God's grace and let him do it through you and then give him the credit and the glory. You say, well, wait, wait, wait. I know a lot of people that are successful and they're not even believers. Well, you know what? They're not really successful. I'll tell you why. They may have outward success, but they have no peace. They have no joy. They're probably totally selfish and self-centered. They give themselves all the credit. They may have no friends. There's a lot of things they're lacking. Just having outward success does not mean that we are a successful person. And I learned that a long time ago, that I was not a successful minister if all I had was a crowd and I had no peace and no joy at home. I found out no matter what I was able to say to you and no matter how many people I could draw in here, if I wasn't enjoying my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that I didn't have a real life. And I want to be truly successful. And only God can make us truly successful. 
We are totally built for God and we are completely incapable of functioning right with anything else. We are created by God, made for God, made for His glory and for nothing else. And until we learn that, we're going to be miserable. Well, what can I do? <laughs> all right, I know we all want to do something. So let me give you, let me give you four things you can do. Number one, believe. <laughs> now that's something to do because it is a spiritual activity. It's not a fleshly activity. I can't change Dave, but I can believe that God can change Dave if Dave, in fact, needs to be changed. And I need to keep in mind that just because I think he needs to change doesn't mean he really needs to change because maybe I'm the one that needs to change and I just don't see it. So that's what it means to come to God with humility. <laughs> Before you start praying for somebody else to change, you better say, oh God, in case... I was reading Obadiah 1.3 last week. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. <laughs> Boy, we can just think that we just don't have any problems and everybody else has got all the problems. And it's because we just don't see ourselves. We look at everybody else through a magnifying glass, but we have these nice rosy colored glasses we look at ourselves through. Amen. The pride of our heart can deceive us. So even when we pray for other people to change, we need to be careful how we pray. So I'll tell you what I do. Any time that I pray for Dave in any area, I always pray for myself at the same time. I just go to God and take us as a group. Amen. John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. Then they said, verse 28, what are we to do? <laughs> you know, I think there's a little demon that's sent out from hell. We each have one. Maybe one on each shoulder. This, this little quirky, squirrely, ugly, slimy, goofy character that sits right about right here. And he just screams in your ear all day. What are you going to do? 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 And we feel pressured to do something. I heard about your problem. What are you going to do? <laughs> and we almost feel dumb if we say, oh. <laughs> but we need to say, nothing that I do would make any difference anyway. I'm waiting on God to do something. Now, if God shows me something, I will do it. But even then, what I do, I'll have to do by His grace. So it's not my doing. It's Him doing it through me. Amen. This is just a nightmare for our flesh because the flesh wants credit. The flesh wants to brag and get a hand clap. Oh, wonderful flesh. <laughs> you pray two hours a day and you don't realize it's God that's given you a gift to be able to do that. You're a great intercessor. God's gifted you as an intercessor. And then you go to lunch with somebody or go to breakfast and you, they're a pretty new Christian. <gasps> Oh, don't mind me. I'm just tired because I get up so early every morning to pray. <laughs> the flesh is just saying, somebody has to know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to know. <laughs> oh, you get up early to pray? Yes, I get up every morning at 5. <laughs> pray until 7 or 8. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so now your flesh got what it wanted. It's puffing. You can feel it. So in order to keep us from being puffed up and too much elated because of the greatness of our prayer life, there is given unto us that day a thorn in the flesh. <laughs> One thing you still lack. <laughs> is anybody home in this house today? 
What? Now, you know, I might have avoided that thorn in the flesh if I could have avoided the pride of trying to take credit for what God was doing. Let's just say that you really do sincerely yawn and somebody says, are you sleepy? Just say, yeah. Oh, did you get up early today? Yes. If they press you, why? <laughs> say, well, I got up early to pray. Oh my, no, don't give me the credit. It's only God working through me that enables me to do that. That's how we can save ourselves from being in trouble all the time. What are we to do that we might be working the works of God? What can we do to carry out what God requires? And Jesus replied, verse 29, this is the work, the service that God asks of you that you believe. Well, there must be something else there. <laughs> no, nope, sure enough, that's all it says. <laughs> that you believe in the one whom he has sent, that you cleave to, trust in, rely on, and have faith in his messenger got to lean into God. Well, how can I tell if I'm believing? It's extremely simple. You want to see it? Hebrews 4, 3. For we who have believed <laughs> do enter the rest of God. How can I tell if I'm believing? I'm not worried. I'm not frustrated. I'm not upset. I don't know when it's going to happen. Don't know that I care all that much. God will do it at the right time. When he's good and ready, me trying to make him hurry won't work. I've found out God's new, usually not early, but he's never late. When we have believed, we do enter the rest of God. God. And that's not laying down on the couch, taking a nap. That's an internal rest. The rest that he's talking about here is a rest that you have in work. It's not a rest from work. It's a rest that we have in work. That's why I said last night, I work hard. Surely you understand that to build and maintain what God has permitted us to have, I have worked very hard and so has Dave. But what I do is not hard work. Does that make any sense? I work hard, but what I do is not hard work because it really is the grace of God doing it through me. Now, here's the thing. I work in my physical body, but I'm not working internally. That's the difference. That's what wears us out is the internal work. I said last night, I would rather do three of these seminars in a row, four sessions each, than to spend one day, one 24-hour period so worried and so stressed out and so anxious or angry at somebody, now that wears me out. That is not rest. But I can do what I'm doing up here today and I can do it totally and completely in the rest of God. I'm not trying to impress you. I hope you like me, but if you don't, you'll have to take it up with God. So you see, then there's, I don't have that pressure. You know how much pressure it is when you go out among people and you feel you have to impress them? Yeah. Nobody is free. Nobody is totally free till you no longer have the need to impress someone. We don't have to impress each other. We need to love one another. We need to serve one another. We need to use the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of other people. They will use their gifts to benefit us. You don't have to sit here and be jealous because some of these girls up here can sing so good. You need to realize God put that gift in them for you. They're working. You're sitting there enjoying it. Amen. Amen. No comparison. No competition. Don't have to be like somebody else. Get to be fully and completely me. Wow. And then verses 10 and 11 in Hebrews 4 say, strive diligently to enter the rest of God. Verse 10, for he who has once entered God's rest has ceased from the weariness and the pain of human labors just as God ceased from those labors that were his own. How can you tell if you're in faith? You have the rest of God. The next thing you can do is you can do what God leads you to do. 
There is obedience. And there is action that we will need to take sometimes in solving the situations that we have. But it's foolish to just go get our own plan and just try to do something to see if it works. What we can do is what God leads us to do. God told Moses, stretch out your rod over the Red Sea and it will part. <laughs> well, I don't think so. But he obeyed. And God parted. I come up here, I open my mouth, and God shows up. See, a lot of people won't even show up. You know, do what you can do. You can work. So work. <laughs> if you don't have a job, you can go look for one, but you can't make somebody hire you. Only God can do that. So we need to do the part that God shows us to do. If you've hurt somebody really bad and God's leading you to go and apologize to them, then humble yourself and go do it. You can't make them forgive you, but you can do your part. See, what we need to do is the part that we can do. Maybe you have hurt somebody terribly. Maybe you have messed up a relationship and maybe there's just no way that you think you can ever get it back. And you just wish with all your heart you would have never done it, but it's too late because you already did it. Now there's no way for you to fix it. But God could fix it. Well, what can I do? Well, if God leads you to, go and humble yourself and say, it was totally my fault. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. But if they won't forgive you, now that's between them and God. That's not your problem anymore. Come on, is somebody with me today? Let's do what God shows us to do because that's faith. Faith without works is dead, but we can't come up with all these works with no faith. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to help. I'd like to take you to Ephesians 6, but I don't have time this morning. It basically says, having done all the crisis demands, stand firmly in your place. And that word stand is the same word that's translated abide in John 15. Having done all that you... Whatever the crisis demands, do what God is showing you to do. Take action. You, use your will. Be energized by the grace of God. And, you know, we, we're not throwing out responsibility. I mean, we have responsibility. We need to do what we know that God has given us to do. But we can't go beyond that. That's where we get in trouble. When we start trying to make something happen that only God can make happen. A woman told me the other day, she said, there's something you said that changed my life. I saw her out in the store somewhere. And I said, I'm waiting to see what this great thing is, I said. And she said, you simply said, let God be God. And see, all things are possible with God, but we've got to get out of his way and let him be God. We have to stop trying to run the universe and let God be God in our lives. You know, the grace of God that saved us is the exact same grace that will change us and help us grow into new levels of godliness. We should all desire that. We cannot change except by the grace of God. Learn how to receive the grace of God in your life. Learn how to depend on it in all things.